good to be here this morning, this Saturday morning, on the 3rd of March. And I wanted to take a few minutes of your time and to talk to you about loving God. And um, it's not a subject that we talk about all the time, and so I wanted to take a few minutes and, uh, and just look at some scriptures and see what the Word of God has to say about us loving God instead of God loving us. Um, last week I went uh, into a Westlake Plaza area and uh, gave a message on um, how God loves us. In uh, the Bible it talks about God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. But this time I, I wanted to reverse, reverse it and to say uh, and to talk about our love for God rather than God's love for us. It's easier to talk about God's love for us because it's uh, demonstrated and it is seen in, in all aspects of life. But our love for God is often concealed and we don't always express our love uh, for God. We don't always express how we feel about God if we have any affections for Him. And so I wanted to make that the topic of our, of our subject today. And so to do so, um, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? I always like to bring God into our um, our time of of worship, and um, there's not going to be much singing today. Uh, that's not until tomorrow. But I um, want to focus on, on on the fact that uh, we want we want God here with us in our midst uh, anytime it involves His Word. Father, we thank you for uh, this awesome opportunity, Lord, to, to to focus on your word and your commands and what your word has to say to us in regards to your love and, and, and to our love toward you. Lord, uh, be in this place right now and um, let you be the object of our love. Teach us how to love you as man, um, for we are your image and it is our sole duty. Um, and it was for this very reason that Heavenly Father, you created us to live on this planet, um, not to accumulate a bunch of things, but you created us and made us so that we would be a people who love their God and a people who serve and worship their God. And so, Lord, uh, teach us how to do that um, and not focus on the accumulation of things, but to bypass the things of this earth that will pass away and to direct our love toward you, O oh Lord, that will last forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, um, before we do, I, I wanted to let those of you out there who uh, know of my writing ministry know that I, I just got these four copies of Let's Talk About Satan. Um, I'm letting you know in case you might have a desire to write and uh, ask for a copy. I don't have any more than that. Just those four. If you want a copy or more uh, copies, you might have to go to Amazon.com um, and ask them or Holy uh, Fire Publishing. That's the publishing company that is um, Holy Fire Publishing. That's the company that is uh, right now um, publishing these books. Uh, and so it's my first book, and it's entitled Let's Talk About Satan. Uh, perhaps at the end of the year, we'll have another book out. Um, not sure which one yet, uh, but if God blesses with this one, then the proceeds from this one will bring out the next book. Uh, and I think it's also, it, it may be uh, either Let's Talk About Jesus or Let's Talk About the Church. Uh, not sure, depending on how well this one does. But in any case, wanting to let you know that... Uh, they're here, and I think they're about 13, 13 or, or 14 dollars at Barnes and Noble. I'm, I'm not sure, or uh, one of those uh, stores. Uh, I'll check on it later, and then I'll put it online. So if you want a copy, uh, just call, and then I'll send you one, uh, and you'll get your first copy of my book. Anyway, we want to talk about um, love God, loving God uh, today, uh, and if you have your Bibles. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 uh, through 9. We want to talk about that. And this is Moses exhorting Israel. Uh, this is his last book that he is writing to the nation. And um, one of the things that he addresses 
is this issue of loving God. He says in Deuteronomy 6, um, as he's exhorting them and warning them, uh, warning them against apostasy, he says to them in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these things and these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and so that's our passage for today but I think we're going to focus on mainly verse 5 that says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Um, we today, um, we all love those who are leaders over us, right? Who doesn't love the leader that God has put over them? Uh, we come to church and we hear them preach, we hear them teach, um, we gather at times just to support their ministries as friends I've gone to churches where it's uh, the pastor knows everybody there he knows uh, the the men from high school or college or uh, in the city somewhere um, those are his parents and these are his aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces and, and these are the different members of his family or you know that's the grocer down the street that's the nurse from the hospital that's the uh, mortician from wherever you know, and he knows all of the people in the congregation and they all come because they love him and they know him and they support him and they say we're going to pastor uh, Jack's church today because pastor Jack is a very uh, he's very good in, in uh, in, in teaching the Bible and he's a good friend of mine I've known him I played golf with him for years another one will say well I'm going to Pastor Jack's church because uh, we grew up together in high school or, you know that's my son and I want to support his ministry I want to go to Pastor Jack's church because Pastor Jack is, is a, his daughter is a good friend of my daughter's and I want to hear what he has to say and so we all have different reasons for going to these people's churches and, and congregations and drawing to them as friends. But we don't want to um, lose, we don't want to lose the perspective of why um, we are the church or why we go to church, or, right? Or why we come together on Sundays or during the, the weekdays, right? We don't ever want to lose that vision, that sight, that purpose, that reason. Um, and, and, and when we do it, um, it should be only for one reason and one reason only. Why we come together, right? It is to love, worship, to honor and praise God. Now, a lot of people when they go to church, they don't think about that, right? But when we do come together, when we do worship together, it should be for that very reason, to love and to worship and to praise God. In other words, God should be the reason why we come together as a church. God should be the reason why we come together to, um, to praise and to pray and to hear the message. What should draw us to a, a meeting place where the church meets and worship is God. God should be the magnet, right? God should be the magnet that, that draws us. Right? God should be the magnet that draws us um, that draws us to himself. If God is not the magnet that draws us to himself, then we are practicing idolatry. If God is not the magnet that draws us to pray, that draws us to love, that draws us to honor, and that draws us to worship and to praise, if God, right, Love God. If God is not the object of, of that, if this is not the magnet, and if he is not the magnet that draws us to, to holiness, 
into purity and to enter the divine world then we are practicing idolatry we are taking pastors to a limit and to a level that we should not we are bringing leaders into the position of God we are giving the glory of God to the wrong person to the wrong person because because of our great love for him right we gather in his name um, whom whom we love we gather in the name of the one whom we love when we come and we we, we, we sit and we hear the message of Pastor Jack we don't come and hear the message of Pastor Jack because and because only we love Pastor Jack but we love the God of Pastor Jack much more than we love Pastor Jack we love his God more than we love him and it is because of his God that we come and we sit at his feet to hear what he has to say about his God whom he also loves more than he loves us Philippians 2 verses 10 through 11 and we'll talk about that a little bit later but Philippians 2 says this it's in uh, it's one of Paul's epistles and Paul says to the church at Philippi Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those on of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father this Jesus Christ is the one whom we should bestow our love toward it is at his name that we gather and we come together and we worship and we pray and we praise and we do all these things our object of worship our deity of worship the reason why we even come together as a church is to honor and to worship and to serve Jesus Christ our Lord whom we love with all of our heart mind soul and strength if that is not the case then we are practicing idolatry as a church and the idolatry is we're giving our affection and our love not only to our brothers are more to our brothers than we are to our God and it is to our God that we should give it first and foremost before we give it to the brethren and so the words of the Lord become more precious to us than the words of our brothers yes we should love one another and encourage each other but our love should be much more for our God I want to define to you what the love of God is um, to define the love of God say to love God is to accept God as our divine authority our deity of worship our object of praise our leader through this life our all sovereign father who controls us to serve him with our lives for all eternity our creator maker and our provider to love God let me repeat the love of God defined to love God right um, to love God is to accept God as our divine authority is to accept God as our deity of worship it is to accept God as our object of praise it is to accept God as our leader through this life it is to accept God as our overall sovereign father who controls us to serve him with our lives for all eternity to accept God as our creator to accept God as our maker and to accept God as our provider the key to loving God is to accept God for who he is in Romans 10 I'm sorry in Romans 1 the Bible says in Romans 1 that God was angry with man why listen to this in verse 1 verse 18 the Bible says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who <coughs> excuse me who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them 
First is the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, he says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now that is what the problem is with all of humanity is that humanity refuses to accept God and honor Him as God. And they refuse to honor Him as God. They refuse to give thanks. Instead, they, became, they become futile in their speculation and their foolish heart become darkened. Right? And so instead of giving God the love that He deserves as our divine authority, our deity of worship, our object of praise, our leader through this life, our own sovereign Father who controls us to serve Him with all of our lives for all eternity, our Creator, our Maker, and our Provider. Instead of loving God to that degree and that level, what do we do instead? Our foolish heart becomes darkened. Our foolish heart becomes darkened. This was an. Uh, this was a. Uh, an object that I was going to use here in a few minutes to to talk about the love of God and it fell. But that's exactly what has happened to us. See, the same way the world has just fallen, this world here, this so if you can see it, I'll, I'll walk up so you can look at it. This is the world. You see the world? The world. I've used this as an uh, object before, but the same way the world you just saw a few minutes ago fall, or you heard it fall, the same the world, because of its fallenness, is incapable of giving God the love that He deserves, and and is incapable of making God the object of their love. The world cannot do that, but the church can. The world cannot love God because that is the description of those who are in the world that Paul talks about here in in Romans chapter 1 verse 21 the Bible says for even though they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculation and their foolish heart was darkened that is the world that is not Israel and that is not the church that is why in the beginning when I read to you Deuteronomy 6, Moses speaking to Israel, instructs them and says to them, And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. That command is given to whom? To the Israelites. But here, what Paul addresses is an issue among the Gentiles. That is, the Gentiles cannot love God this way. And furthermore, not just the Gentiles, but there are some Jews and some Christians even, who cannot love God this way because of sin that is in their nature, because of the fallenness of their nature. God has not become the object of their worship. But instead, God has become the enemy. And God is not our enemy. He is our creator. God is our maker. We are created in His image. He should be our object of praise. He should be our object of adoration. He should be our object of, of love. If there is someone that we need to give love to, it should be God. It should be God. Men thrive on, on sexual love. But God is calling us to a higher love. That is the spiritual love that we have for Him as a Father. And that is what is missing out of each one of us. Sexual love is easy to give to someone. That's part of our package. However, spiritual love, loving the God whom we cannot see, and yet loving Him for all that He has made. Look at the world He's given to us. Look at the continent that we live in. Look, go into the Pike Place Market and just look at all the meat and all the fruits and vegetables and all the different types of people that are there. That should cause us to love God and appreciate God, not become foolish and, and darkened against Him. 
you know, we, we often see these things and we take it for granted because we don't realize that it is God's love that causes him to make all these different types of fruits and vegetables. Not his obligation, but his love. God is not obligated to make fish. God is not obligated to make man. God is not obligated to make women and children. God doesn't have an obligation to any one of us. The earth itself was not created based on God's obligation to man or to creation, but he, this was his demonstration of love. The earth was created as a demonstration to how much he loves us. He loves us and therefore he demonstrated that love by calling us into existence, by calling the earth into existence. When you love a vehicle, let's say you have an old vehicle and you make the decision to take some money and to repair the old vehicle, to add a new engine, to give it a new paint of coat, uh, to change the spark plugs, perhaps uh, rewire the vehicle, change the four tires, the old tires to new tires, give it a new coat of paint and it looks sparkling new within two months or so after you've done all the repairs. I had a friend years ago in high school who used to do that. I picked up uh, uh, an old Chevy Monza and um, and he was able to fix that vehicle for me and with it we went all over the place as long as it was working and, and then of course he got his own vehicle and then he spent all day and all night fixing it because he loved the car. But we don't pour our energy and our time into objects in whom we hate. We pour all of our energy and, and, and our time and our lives into the things that we love. And so God loved his creation and therefore he spends every single day providing for it. Um, doing things that we don't even fathom in our thinking. You know, we, we don't know what it's like to create a world and to keep it and to maintain it on, on, a, on a daily, moment by moment, second by second, every single day. It takes a lot of love to do that takes a lot of patience to do that. Um, the, the, the car, the object, whatever it is that we have that we love to do or we love to take care of, we do it because we love it. We love the vehicle. We love to build houses. Therefore, we take the time to design it and, and, and from scratch, you know, we, we draw it out. And then if we have the money in the bank, we go and we purchase all of the material and we build the house and then we sell it. And then we do it over and over and over again. Uh, people who are in real estate do that sort of things. They do it with buildings. They do it because they love it, not because they hate it, but because they love to do it. And therefore God loves the earth and he loves man on earth. Therefore he continues to create the image of man. He, you know, to, to create man in his image because he loves man. He loves to create man, different types of man. You know, tall ones, short ones, black ones, white ones. Uh, people from all different types of nations. He adds uh, languages and, and he adds uh, beauty to them. And some of them are fair and unfair. I mean, I mean, he does so many, you know, so much with man that it's incredible. Sometimes you look at someone and you have to take a couple steps back with, with just what he has done. Why? Because this is a demonstration of his love. This is what he does best. It's his love that 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 consumes him and at, at the consummation of his love he, you know he went as far as dying on a cross for us right he went as far as dying on a cross for us just so that he can preserve him in, 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 in that love and so should we toward him right so if God loves us that much to create an earth and, and to come down how much more should we love him how much more should we demonstrate that love toward him our spirit should never be darkened toward God. Our speculations, <clears throat> this should, you know, we should, there should never be a time when we don't honor God, right? There should never be a time when we don't give thanks. We've got plenty of reason to give thanks. The fact that we even have life and we, we, we have been introduced to this thing called life. Remember what I said, God doesn't have an obligation to create us and therefore we should be thankful and grateful that he even brought us into this thing called life right we didn't know that this thing called life uh, was in existence prior to our birth 
right, prior to being born and, and being created in our mother's wombs, we had no idea this thing called life was going on, right? When you look at a baby in a, uh, in a, in a basket or, or one of those push trolleys, uh, tro trollers, I think that's what they're called, the trolley, um, the baby has no idea the world that he or she has been brought into. Right, not until 10, 15 years, and then they look around and, and, and they don't even realize that there was a time when they weren't even there. But now, 15, 20, 30, 40, 60 years into this thing called life, you know, we look around and, and we're like, wow, this is the earth. Right? It's like, yeah, I, we didn't know this place existed. But uh, this alone, this reality alone should cause us to give thanks to God and to honor Him. But instead, the scripture says in Romans 1 that we do not honor God. And so our first point was the love of God defined. And that is to love God. Um, to love God is to accept God. Right? To love God is to accept God. Accept Him for who He is. We don't have to see Him with our physical eyes because that same passage of scripture in Romans 1 tells us that by the creation of the earth and all that is in it, the, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. In other words, you have an understanding, right? As a result of what you see in creation, you have an understanding that God is behind the sun shining, the wind blowing, the greenery of the earth, right? And the food and everything. And that alone should cause you to give thanks. And, you know, as soon as you get your meal, you bow your head and you give thanks to the Almighty for having provided it. And so we define the love of God as accepting God as, as our divine authority, accepting Him as our deity of worship, right? There shouldn't be a stone um, or a wood or, or, or anything or anyone that we should attribute our worship and love to other than God. We define the love of God as accepting Him as our object of praise, um, our leader through this life. You know, people think that God cannot lead us, but God can. He, if He can provide, He can also lead. He can lead us through His Holy Spirit. He can lead us through His Scriptures, right? He can lead us through the leaders of the church, if we're willing to accept their leadership. Some people do, and some people don't. Um, we also define the, the uh, loving God as accepting Him as our all-sovereign Father. Remember, Jesus says, um, when we pray, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so we, to love God is to accept him as our all-sovereign father. He, that means he's over everything. And who controls us to serve him um, with all of our, our lives for all eternity. Um, we also accept him as our creator, our maker, and our provider. The second point is the command to love God. Right, which we find in, 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 in Deuteronomy 6 4. And in this passage, basically, um, what Moses does, he tells us how we can love God. Right? We, we've defined the love of God, but he says, How do you love an invisible God? How do you love an invisible God that's not directly in front of you? How do you demonstrate that love? It's different than when you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or when you have a spouse or a child or, or a parent. Right? It's easy to give them love. It, you know, you buy them a gift, um, you take them out to dinner, uh, you give them their favorite thing, you, you, you give them permission to do something, um, you, they can use the car, uh, they can stay out late at night, they can get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, uh, they can uh, buy something that you wouldn't allow them to buy, they can take a different position in life. These are the ways that uh, parents you know, and, and friends show love to each other. Um, a promotion, perhaps, uh, from an employer um, to an employee. These are different ways to demonstrate and to show love uh, to others. But how do you love God when you cannot see, right? And so Moses says here in Deuteronomy 6, uh, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And remember, he's talking to the Jews, right? He's talking to Israel, the people that were in bondage and who were removed out from under Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And the Egyptians were an idolatrous people who did not know God. Remember, when Moses went 
to uh, Pharaoh and, and say, the Lord our God has commanded that you should let Israel go, um, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should let Israel go? He didn't know the Lord. He says, who is he? Because what were they worshipping? They were worshipping idols and snakes and, and the cobras and, and serpents. That's why when the Egyptians, they have that cobra on top of their head, right? Um, that's that's the symbol of, uh, of perhaps they have to honor the animal because there are so many of them in Egypt, right? They may not worship the animal, but they have to give the animal its respect. Um, and I think Ra was the god that they attributed as their object of worship. So when the Jews were removed out from under them, God basically instructed them in Exodus um, that there shall be no other uh, before them, and that they are not to go to another deity. And the very first command that God gave to the Jews was, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. There's nobody else. I am the one who did it. And he says, and you, sh you should have no other gods before me as a result of this. Um, you, you shall not make for yourself idols. He forbids idolatry. Um, he says, or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or anything from under the earth. In other words, no, no fish. Um, you're not supposed to worship them or you're not supposed to serve them because he himself is the Lord and he is a jealous God. And he will uh, visit this iniquity upon the fathers and, and, and the children and the, and all the, and the third and the fourth generation of those who hate him. Um, but he's going to show his loving kindness to the thousands of those who love him and keep his commandments. And so here you have in the passage, there are those who hate God and they make those idolatrous things um, to spurn him. And then there are those who love God. And those are the ones who worship him and and praise him. And so Moses here says, he commands Israel, he reminds Israel of, of the Ten Commandments. And, and the, first, uh, and the f first command was, you shall only love him and no, and no one else. In other words, don't go back to the, to the heart that you had when you were in Egypt. Don't go back to that, that time when you used to worship those objects alongside the Egyptian people. I've introduced myself to you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your forefathers. You are to love me, and you are to give me your time and, and your effort. And I am not a God who is made out of an idol. You know, uh, you cannot put me in, in the place of an idol. Do not do that. Um, I, that is not who I am. I am the Lord, and that is my name. Um, you know, he, he tries to make it as real as he possibly can for the Jews and so that the Jews would know who he is and so that the Jews would not dishonor him um, by making these idolatrous things. And so Moses commands uh, the Jews um, and he says to them, Love the Lord your God. And he says, Your God. Right? And in other words, he makes it personal so that they understand that it is... Um, he is their personal authority. He is their personal object of 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 worship. And he's, it's almost like saying, "This is your car. This is your house." When when you say "your," that means it is it's it's your personal um, it's your personal possession, right? As God says, "You are my people. I am your God. You are my people." So they belong to each other. Right? Israel and God belongs to each other. They have that love relationship. Right? And so and so he says to them, and you shall love the Lord your God. He didn't say you shall hate the love your God. You shall run from the love your God. You shall hide from the love your God the Lord your God. You shall uh, spurn him, tick him off, make him angry, or any of those things. But instead he says you shall love him. How difficult is it to love? It's not that difficult at all. To love is to basically, um, and this is, I guess, what he, he, he does with the rest of the passage is, you, you, how do you love? You love with your heart. You love with your heart, right? You love by honoring. In other words, see him for who he is and honor him for who he is. You love by honoring him for who he is. 
Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is deceitful above all else I the Lord search the heart and I test the mind right what's wrong with the heart Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick who can understand it right it is desperately sick who can understand it mark 7 mark 7 says 21 Mark 7, 21 through 23 says the heart, out of the heart of man, you know, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and fornications, um, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and, and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. But here, Moses says that you shall love the Lord your God with what? With all of your heart. How do you do that with such a wicked heart? Right? Every intent of their heart was e only evil continually. Whereas now Moses is saying, take that evil heart, that heart that is deceitful, that heart that is full of wickedness, that heart that is whose intentions are always evil continually, and love God with it. Change the course of your heart and love God with it. Instead of being evil, deceitful, uh, wit having wicked intention with your heart, love God with your heart. Show affection to God with your heart. Love Him from that heart of yours. And if you show God your love, what will God do in return? He will show you His love. Right? When you show a girl that you love her, what will she do in return? She will show you love. Love for love. Um, as long as it's not the wrong kind of love in the wrong kind of context. Right? As long as it's not the wrong kind of love. You know, it's not one dude looking at another dude and going, dude, I love you. You know. It, that's not the kind of love that we want in the body of Christ. We want the other kind of love. The brotherly kind of love. Where it says, brother, I love you. And he says, brother, I love you too. And then, you know, the Bible commands us to love one another. And so we want that pure kind of love. Right? And so God says, take that, that, that heart that is filled with all of that and love God with it. He says, love God with all your heart. Love God with all your soul. The soul, I consider it to be like the spirit. You know, John 4.24 John 4.24 say that, um, and I might have to do a study on, on, on the whole soul-spirit thing uh, to be more uh, detailed on that, but John 4.24 says this. He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, it doesn't say anything about love in there, but the command in Deuteronomy 6, 5 is to love your God with all your soul, right? To love your God with all your soul. And I guess what I'm trying to emphasize by using John 4, 24 is that um, when we worship God, right, we worship God in spirit. And so our souls should worship him like our spirit worship him, right? The same way our spirit is to worship God um, in, 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 in spirit so does our soul must worship him in spirit, right? We must worship him, and worship comes because of love, right? You don't love something, you don't uh, worship something that you don't love. You love something, and as a result of your love, you, you show them honor and affection, and, and, and so with, with our souls, we worship, and with our souls, we love, right? And so we do with our spirit. The same way we worship with our spirit, so must we love with our spirit and our soul. And so here, Moses is emphasizing, as the Apostle John emphasizes in John 4.24, to, to worship him in spirit. Here it says to love him in spirit, love him with our souls. And so um, Moses says, and I'm making a comparison between the two passages, the Old Testament command to uh, love God with our soul and the New Testament command uh, to love God with, 
to worship God with our spirit. And I'm saying simultaneously, it's almost the same thing. And to love is to worship, and to worship is to love. As we love with our soul, so must we love with our spirit. And as we worship with our spirit, so must we worship with our souls. And so he says, we are to love him with our, our all of our heart. We must love him with our, 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 our soul. Or, and some people say, with all of our mind. Some passages of scripture, some translators will take that that uh, that word and instead of saying all of our, our, our souls, and, and they'll use mind and say, you know, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all of your, your heart, your mind, and, 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 and soul and spirit. So it's different. But anyway, love the God with all of your might. With all of your might. You know, what is might? Right? All of our strength. Right? When all of our strength. When I think of that, it brought me to 1 Samuel 17, verses 26, and then uh, verses 31 through 37. Samuel is the book that begins the reign of all the kings of Israel. And so in 1 Samuel um, chapter 17, verse 26, all the way down to 49, is the story of David and Goliath. And David loved God so much that, you know, it brought out his might, his strength, and his zeal, and his heart, and his soul. Um, you know, just, just, this is a perfect demonstration of a man who loves God. Right? He was a man after God's own heart. That's what David was considered. And so in verse 26, the Bible says, Then David spoke to the sons of uh, David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in accord with uh, this word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Um, now, Eliab, his, older, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger burned against David and he said why have you come down and with whom have uh, you left those few sheep in the wilderness I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart for you have come down in order to see the battle um, but David said uh, what have I done now uh, was it not just a question uh, he turned away from him to another and said uh, the same thing. And, and the people answered the same thing as before. Um, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he said for him. And David uh, said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Uh, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then uh, Saul said to David, uh, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, uh, while he has uh, been a warrior from his youth. Verse 34, But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and, and rescued it from his mouth and when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And um, David continues, and, and the Bible says, And David said, The Lord uh, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head. And he clothed them with uh, armor. And David girded his sword uh, over his armor and tried uh, to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. Um, and he took his stick in his hand and, and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And apparently there was a brook there where they were drinking water from. And scripture says, and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had even in his, in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. 
um, verse 41, Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. Uh, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and rudy, with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David and his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of, of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Um, well, verse 48, I guess we might as well read till the end, it says, uh, Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to me, David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Well, it seems here that David's love for God got a hold of him. And he loved God so much that he went face to face with a giant. A giant which may have been 10, 15 feet uh, tall. And David might have only been a five foot tall man. Um, and, 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 and so, in the Bible, he says here that he was a youth, but his love, his zeal for God, right, uh, was demonstrated. You know, the command was fulfilled. David loved God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his uh, um, soul. And in doing so, he disdain this, this Philistine, this giant of a man. He went toe to toe with him just to show God um, and, and, and the armies of Israel that my love for God is greater than that giant of a man that's up there mouthing off and cursing our God. And with the love of God came the might of God. And the might of God came upon David and he slung the rock and it, and it hit the Philistine here killed him and he chopped off his head and so God's love this zeal that this young man had for God was so much so it's just like Jesus' love for the Father was so much that he went into the temple and when he saw that the temple was being used for the wrong purpose or reason he turned the tables of the money changers and um, removed all the doves and, and drove out the people that were in there because the temple of God was being used for the wrong purpose and the wrong reason. And so David uh, fulfilled that command to love God by killing the Philistine. Jesus fulfilled that command of loving God by clearing out the temple. How will you show God that you love him? How will you fulfill the command to love God with all of your heart, soul, might, and strength? How will you show God that you love him today? Philippians 4, 8, the Apostle Paul says, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, let your mind dwell on these things. Those who have a pure mind are also able to show God their love by having a pure mind, right? Paul says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, let your mind dwell on these things. So we love God with our soul, with our heart, we love God with our soul, we love God with our might, and we love God with our mind, with our pure mind, right? We want to love God with a pure mind. Um, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things, right? You want to love God with a pure mind. You don't want to love God with a contaminated mind. Um, we, can, we also love God with our actions. As you saw, uh, David, his action proved his love for God, and Israel won the war against the Philistines. Hebrew, uh, in James chapter 2, James says that our faith, right, James says, What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? David had faith in God, and therefore he demonstrated his faith in God and his love for God by killing the Philistine. Paul says, If a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. If you say you have faith in God, and you say that you love God, your love for God, right, will be demonstrated by the faith that you practice, by the thing that you do. It's not what you just say with your mouth, but it's what you do with that faith that He has given you. And the love that is in you is what generates the faith that comes out of you to do the things that you do on his behalf to demonstrate your love for him. So don't ever say you love God and yet you're not willing to go out there and share the gospel with, with, with the world. Don't ever say you love God and yet you're not willing to pray to him and speak to him. Don't ever say you love God but you, go, you draw near to the house of God to meet with your friends and your buddies. Don't ever say you love God and yet, you're not even willing to spend a, a, a five minutes reading his word. Don't ever say you love God, and yet um, you'll do all kinds of evil in his sight. You know, the Bible says that God sits on heaven's throne, Psalms 33, and he sees the sons of man, and he sees all of that we're doing on a daily basis. He sees us, he hears us, he feels us, he knows us. And yet, all that we do, and that he witnesses, is not... He's not looking at a people who love him. He's looking at a people who is hardened against him. And therefore, we do things that are evil in his sight. If you come into someone's home and rob them and rape them and molest them, that's not showing them. That's not showing God that you love him. That's, that's making, basically, what you're communicating to God is that you're not even conscious of his presence. Psalms 139 says that God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's um, omniscient. He knows everything. He is everywhere. And he, and, and he sees everything. How can you walk on, on the earth that hangs on nothing and not know that God is watching you? Right? Those who love God are conscious of God. In other words, they're God conscious. They know that he's watching and listening. Therefore, they're careful about what they do. What, have you ever gone to a friend's house? And the house is clean as a whistle. And because of your love for your friend, you're very careful on where you sit or what you do in that house. You're very careful at what you say. Because you don't know if your friend will hear you. What you touch. Because you don't want your friend to be offended. You have high regards for your friend, and therefore you're very careful about what you do behind his back. You know, he could walk out the house, leave you by yourself, and when he comes back, the house is the same as he left it. Why? Because you respect him. Well, so it should be on the earth. Because God has put us there and has walked away. Does that mean that we now have the right to do whatever we want on the earth? Because he's not there to see us? Or so we think that he's not there to see us? No. We should have high regards for God. And therefore, as a result of it, our faith in Him and our love for Him should have us work for Him, defend Him as David defended Him, serve Him as Paul says in, um, as, as, as not Paul, but James says, um, that our faith should be demonstrated in what we do, but not just our faith, but our love. So the second command is, uh, is the command is to love God, um, we've defined the love of God, we've seen the command of God, and finally, um, love the exalted name of Jesus, right? Love the exalted name of Jesus, who is our God. Remember, I told you in the beginning that 
we're going to be looking at Philippians 2, 10 through 11. Um, if, uh, Philippians 2, 10, Philippians 2, 10 and 11, um, says this. Uh, actually, let's start in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Therefore, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The command was for us to love the Lord our God. But here in Philippians, it says that at the name of Jesus, right, Every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Is Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Love the Lord our God. But who is the Lord our God? Jesus Christ. Right? Love the Lord our God with all of our, of our heart, soul, and might. But Paul says here that we should love that we should, um, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Lord whom we what? We love with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Now we are introduced to the love, to the, to the God whom we should love with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. His name is Jesus Christ. Right? We're introduced to him, and he is called Jesus Christ. And we should bow before him and confess that he is what? Lord. Why should we confess that he is Lord? To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Remember, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so... Our third point is we are to love the exalted name of Jesus. Right? We are to love the exalted name of Jesus. Um, every knee should bow to him. Every tongue should confess his name. And should confess that he is Lord. And remember Jesus walked the earth and demonstrated to everyone what his lordship consisted of. Right? His power, his authority. He walked on water. He healed the sick. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. He spoke uh, creation into calmness. Um, he did all of these things to demonstrate his lordship, the fact that he is God. And the same power that the God of Moses demonstrated, so did he when he was incarnated in human flesh. Um, the same way we love God is the same way we should love Jesus who has revealed to us his divinity and his lordship as God. It's the same way we should also love one another, who are the bearers of the Holy Spirit of God. Right? How do you love God? You can love him directly. You can love him through Jesus. You can love God through a brother. You'll say, well, how does that demonstrate a love toward God? The Bible says in 1 John, how can you love how can you say you love God and hate your brother, right? And yet the scripture says that if you show love toward your brother, <coughs> you are showing you can you are also showing love toward God. Scripture says that um, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. But the one, but by this we. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so to demonstrate love to God, love toward God or love for God, we should also love one another. Why? 
because as Christians the Spirit of God abides in us and so when we love one another we're loving the Spirit of God in each other so we can love God directly love God through his son Jesus or love God by loving one another one other way that we love God is also by loving his law right you go to Psalms in the Old Testament I believe it's either Psalms 19 or Psalms 119 and uh, and the psalmist expresses his love for the law of God I think it's in Psalms 119 Psalms 119 says oh how I love thy law it is a meditation um, If you read through Psalms 119 and several uh, of the passages, it, it, um, the psalmist expresses his, his love, um, his love for 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 the law of God, and, and and he appreciates the law of God, and the law of God is 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 an encouragement to him, and the law of God is a blessing to him, and um, and he loves the law of God, and so what is the law of God? It is the written Word of God. Um, it is the written. It is the Word of God written down um, in the form of law, right? It, it is. It is God's law written down. It is God's verbal word written down to us. And so, when we show love for for the written word, we are also showing love for what for who God is, for the God who has spoken these words that have been written. And so we demonstrate our our love um, directly through Jesus, through one another, through the law, and through the spirit that is within us. And so when we love the exalted name of Jesus, we are showing and demonstrating our love for God. So today we took a few minutes to, to talk about, um, to define the love of God, to understand the command um, that, we, that the Jews had been given, but we who are the church are also obligated to fulfill that command in our own lives and those who are in the world um, now should understand that they too have an obligation not to have a darkened heart toward God and, 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 to, and, and not to honor Him but instead to love God and now we've just looked at the exalted name of Jesus and the name of Jesus is known all over the world and it is one of the most common names known in all of, of, uh, of the earth Everybody knows the name of Jesus, and uh, they know what he did on the cross, and they know that he, he, uh, he came, but not only should we know the name, but we should also exalt the name, and we should confess the name and bow to the name of Jesus and demonstrate to him that we love him. So in conclusion, um, when you go to church or a Bible study, you know, let it be because you have a great affectionate love for the Lord God. Um, whom you have uh, come to worship, um, whom you have come to praise and adore. You know, remember Peter, three times, um, Peter was asked by the Lord, do you love me? Right? In John uh, 21, verses 15 through 18, three times, the Lord said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter was grieved when he heard it, three times. You know, um, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. You know, I think that's the struggle that we all have as Americans. Do we love him? Do we love Jesus, the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of the church, and the God of our, e our individual lives? Do we love him? Not just do we know his name. Of course we know his name. Everybody knows his name. Knowing his name is one thing. 
um, celebrating his name at Christmas and Easter is another thing. We have to love Jesus more than we love our grandmothers and our grandfathers and our fathers and our mothers. We have to love Jesus more than we love the objects of this world and the things of this world and even the lifetime that we have been given. We have to love Jesus more than anyone and anything. Even our spouses and our children. Why? Because our love for him will be demonstrated toward us for all of eternity. Right? Our love for him must be demonstrated for all eternity. It's a love relationship that creator and creation has. And he is our creator and he's asking us to love him. And thus we should. More than anything or anyone. More than sexual love. More than that affection that we have toward our sexual partner. We must put our love toward him. Right? And so, the most important um, part of our lives is to love God. And our love for God will, will lead us to do great things on his behalf. And it is our love for him that uh, will draw us to prayer and to praise and, and exalt his name. Right? Even the angels of heaven love God. Revelations 5.13 The whole theme of creation is love. The whole theme of creation is love. The fact that God created angels and created man. And he's, you know the Bible says even the rocks will cry out. All of creation, the Bible says. All of creation does what? And I want to read you this last verse. The whole, um, you know, the whole theme of creation is love. The entire theme of why God created and called all man into existence and creation into existence was so that he can receive not our hate, not our um, wrath and, and judgment and doubt, disbelief, and, um, and, 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 and our suspecting him. And God did not go through all of that on Calvary's cross and and have made man in his image and allowed us to completely come out as we have on this earth for any other reason, reason but for the fact that he wants our love. Revelations chapter 5 verse 13 says, And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. The theme behind that worship is our love. Our love for who? The one who sits on the throne. Our love for the Lamb. And our love for the Holy Spirit that does what? That generates in us the worship and the praise for them. Love. Love is the theme of creation. God wants our love, not our hate and our doubt and our disillusionment. Father, I want to thank you for this hour and thank you, Lord God, that many and those who take the time to hear this video and to watch it will be blessed. May you, Lord God, be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen.